Hello, you're listening to Hear This Idea, a podcast showcasing new thinking in philosophy, the social sciences, and effective altruism. For our last episode in this animal advocacy mini series we've been doing, we wanted to delve a bit deeper into what ways you can actually get involved. So ideally, we wanted to talk to someone who has experience in movement building or leading a major NGO or being a social entrepreneur. Amazingly, our guest, Sebastian Joy, has done all three. He is currently the founding president of ProVeg International, a food awareness organization working to transform the global food system. As we hear in this episode, Sebastian helped build this organization from scratch to now having over 40 employees active in more than eight countries. Along the way, he has also campaigned for PETA, helped develop vitamin B12 toothpastes for vegan, and most recently was involved in launching the 50 by 40 International Alliance, which is looking to cut the global consumption of animal products in half by the year 2040. Sebastian is also a mentor for the incubator Charity Entrepreneurship and lectured non-profit management at the Berlin School of Economics and Law. So as you can imagine, this is quite a packed episode. We spend a bunch of time just talking to Sebastian about his experiences and what he learned from them. We also delve a bit deeper into some topics in animal advocacy that we haven't touched upon in previous episodes. This includes corporate engagement, the different interest groups when it comes to plant-based alternatives, and advice for launching a startup in this area. If you want to find out more about anything we talk about in this episode, do have a look at the right up, which is on our website including a bunch of resources if you are interested in pursuing a career in animal advocacy. But without any further ado, here's the episode. My name is Sebastian Joy. Um, I consider myself an effective altruist and I focus explicitly on the food sector. And I see myself as a serial social entrepreneur trying to make the world as much better as possible by launching various initiatives. In particular, I'm the founding president of ProVeg International, which is an international food awareness organization, and I'm also the co-founder of 50by40.org. Awesome. We will be exploring what ProVeg is and what they do, as well as 50 by, by 40 as you mentioned. But before we do that, let's find out a bit more about you and your kind of journey towards animal advocacy and effective altruism. As a first question then, how did you get involved with animal advocacy? How did you find out about it and what was kind of your pathway to, to where you are now? Well, I became a utilitarian back in high school, I think when I was like 15 or 16, and we learned about the different philosophies in our ethics class, but I was not really involved in animal advocacy for a long time because I'm, you know, I'm not particularly fond of animals. I mean, I like animals, but I'm, you know, not the, the classical animal lover. Um, so I started off my, you know, my studies uh, getting a bachelor's in cognitive science. Some classes we had were like philosophy of mind and neuropsychology. And then we also learned about animals, you know, cognition of animals. And I was uh, interested in those studies. And, you know, that made me realize, well, how morally justified is it actually to eat animals? And so it was actually as a New Year's resolution that I decided to try being vegetarian for a little while. And then uh, one of my supervisor, when I was actually writing my bachelor thesis, he drew my attention to Peter Singer and some article of his, you know, in particular, you know, all animals are equal. It's, I think it's the, the first chapter in animal liberation that convinced me quite to basically dedicate my life to um, make the world a better place for animals because just the, the amount of suffering and the amount of animals being impacted and the, the way it was neglected was just too overwhelming and not to get active in that sphere. I'm really curious then, like what really it was about Peter Singer's arguments in particular that really affected you, opposed to, to all the other different ways people might get exposed to animal rights and animal welfare. Well, I mean, to be fair, I don't know if it was only Peter Singer. You know, at that time, I also, you know, saw a lot of like footage, for example, you know, like how animals are being treated in the food system. And I also met a few other vegans at that time. You know, a few months earlier, I didn't even know that that existed. But what I liked about Peter Singer, I think, was really like his, on the one hand, his rational arguments that he was making. Um, so I found it really very compelling. And also his, he makes these analogies with history, you know, whether it's, you know, slavery or the women's rights movement. And at that time in, in my life, I had the privilege of having received a scholarship basically from the, from my state's government. Whenever I had, had 
I was in contact with them. The place where they were based were, uh, was the Geschwister Scholl uh, Platz in Munich, which is basically the uh, Geschwister Scholl is like where the famous resistance fighters in the, in, during the Nazi regime. So I always had like this kind of like, on the one hand, I felt privileged having received, you know, these uh, this prestigious scholarship and then always like, you know, having been reminded about people who fought the resistance. And then, you know, here you have Peter Singer, who has parents himself or, or grandparents who survived the Holocaust, making this case by drawing on historic conclusions. And so my thinking was, you know, okay, it's easy to judge the mistakes of one parents or one grandparents, but what are going to be the, you know, the mistakes one makes that, you know, maybe potential or future grandchildren are going to judge oneself. And I think that was something that really, you know, very much moved me at that time. It's interesting to hear you explain how you started off interested in utilitarianism and effective altruism, and then you move to a specific interest in animal welfare. I get the impression that most people start off with a kind of general, you know, they're like animal lovers, they like animal welfare, and then they learn about this kind of set of tools from effective altruism, which can be applied to this thing they're already interested in. Is there something that is kind of special or useful that you found about the direction that you took, which is starting off as an effective altruist and then moving into animal advocacy? I mean, I think it probably has the benefit that, you know, you're more cost neutral that way. You know, I see myself as a rational person and I really like numbers and I I like to be passionate about something, but couldn't really find a cause that I was dedicated to. So it was more like I was passionate about principles. Um, you know, I was involved in, I, I actually became a paramedic, you know, like helping people who have like, you know, heart attacks and so on. I thought, oh my God, I'm going to, you know, save people, you know, who die. And then I actually learned that you don't actually help that many people by being a paramedic or, you know, or most people actually, you know, have heart attacks because the way they eat is actually broken. So, you know, it's probably better to, you know, stop the bleeding from where it actually is instead of working on the symptoms. Yeah. So coming to your question, I mean, yeah, I, I personally found it quite helpful to, you know, start in a more cost neutral way, but then once I've really learned this and, and now I'm actually kind of, I mean, I, cause I did sometimes think, well, should I change my career? You know, are there other animal or are there other, you know, EA causes that might be more worthwhile to pursuing? But whenever I really look at, you know, look at the numbers of animals being impacted and uh, you know, the way that they are treated and, Granted, I mean, I'm actually not, I, I, I don't really see myself, you know, being in there so much in the, you know, narrow sense of the animal advocacy movement, you know, because whether it's pro rich or 50 by 40, we really work on, you know, changing the global food system and even pro rich, you know, we frame ourselves as a multi-problem solver. So whether it's climate change or it's, you know, public health, basically also, you know, survival of our species on a large extent. So that's actually what really uh, motivates me and keeps me going. You were also involved, actually, with, let's say, more direct animal advocacy things uh, in, in your kind of early years, especially with, with Peter. Uh, can you briefly talk about what you did there and what you kind of learned from that experience as well? Yes. Yeah. So Peter was quite funny. So basically, I just finished my bachelor's in cognitive science and I was actually on track to getting my master's in, uh, in neuroscience. Uh, you know, I had uh, quite, I was accepted at quite a prestigious university and I was about to start, but then, you know, at that time I became vegan and I've read the Peter Singer articles that I said, and I basically said, look, I, I, I cannot do this. I cannot just, you know, continue and getting like a master's in something, you know, I mean, I love neuroscience, but you know, I, I, it was hard for me to really make a connection, how I can make the world a better place with that directly. Uh, so at that time, you know, I asked my fellow, you know, vegan activists at that time, okay, well, you know, I really want to dedicate my life to this. And they, at that time, ironically said, well, Sebastian, you're crazy. You know, you cannot make a living with, you know, animal advocacy, you know, you should, you know, get, get your masters. I said, no, 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 I don't want to do that. And then the only organization at that time that actually had paid staffers that was, you know, uh, vegan uh, was PETA, at least in Germany. So I basically, I called up PETA and I said, look, I'm, I have a scholarship, so you don't have to worry about paying me, but I basically have one year that I can work for free. Are you interested? And obviously they were quite interested. So I, I spent uh, I spent a year at PETA. And yeah, as you said, you know, it was a lot of direct action. You know, we did, you know, whether it was running, you know, running of the nudes, you know, like when Pamplona, where they have these Spain, uh, this, uh, this bullfightings, or we did um, the fashion shows in Italy where I was jumping on catwalks, uh, you know, and they were uh, promoting fur or, you know, getting arrested and lots of stuff. And to be honest, I mean, at that time, you know, I was young and I was really, was extremely passionate about my convictions. So I was quite, um, 
I, I really enjoyed it. You know, it was really uh, quite quite a fun time. But at that time, I also realized, okay, I'm actually really, you know, I'm, well, the, the word didn't exist at that time, but, you know, it was basically an effective altruist at heart or utilitarian. Um, so I always thought, okay, I really want to focus on farmed animals or, or animals that are being eaten and not so much, you know, fur animals or vivisection or, you know, animals in entertainment. And this is why I really, you know, started more and more focusing on that area. I've had a lot of interesting conversations about the kind of relative merits of very sensible, cleaned up kind of advocacy with like proper website, suit and tie type stuff and of on the ground um, activism, like going and getting yourself arrested and making making like newspaper covers and stuff. As a consequentialist, I mean, how do you weigh up those two kind of modes of activism? Um, is there some merit to just the shock treatment of doing ridiculous stuff for a cause? <laughs> Well, I actually don't know if I if I did it more for others or for myself. I think it, I certainly I think it certainly felt good at that time, and I think you know that was you know that was like you know fifteen you know twenty years ago. So that the time was also different. You know, like corporate outreach looked a whole different. You know, the the movement much was was much much younger. And I think you know there is, uh, you know, there is married to different forms of activism in different stages of the movement. You know, when it's more about you know getting people riled up or getting people you know even when you read like you know Henry Spira, so. I think in the beginning it really was more, you know, what what I thought would work. But then obviously, you know, I think it's really important to really sit down and think, okay, is this really the most effective way that I can do? And that is that was always my bottom line, you know, how can I how can I help the most animals? How can I make the world the, the most better place. And that's why, you know, like consistently over the last, you know, 15 years, I've always changed trajectory when I when I realized, okay, maybe that is not the most efficient way I can I can contribute. One thing I'm curious about as well is you kind of emphasize, right, like the constraints as well, I guess, like with where the animal advocacy movement was at at the time and that pizza was one of the, the few places with with paid positions. But um, I'm also curious, like how it affected you, like as a development and like what kind of skills and what kind of insights you learned? Because one big focus, right, like from the 80,000 hours idea is that your career is really this long this really like long time scale, right? Where like most of your impact will happen towards the end and it is worth trying out a lot of different things and exposing yourself to different ideas and getting different uh, career capital as well. Were there any like one or two key lessons uh, at, at the start um, with, with Peter or elsewhere that you thought were really beneficial for what you did later on? Well, looking back, I think I'm, I mean, you know, as I said, I, I, I was at Peter for a year and they actually wanted me to stay at that time. Um, but I did, I did think, okay, what, what's the best way I can contribute? And it wasn't really clear at that time. You know, I, I definitely knew, okay, I don't have the looks of Pamela Anderson. I cannot sing like Paul McCartney, you know, like the, you know, famous, uh, Peter supporters at that time. Um, but I thought, okay, maybe I can, I can manage. And I definitely wanted to build, you know, more career capital. And that's actually why I did get a master's in nonprofit management. So basically for, you know, more than two years, I basically had to back burner my, my activism to a large extent. I mean, you know, I was, you know, in university, I was still active on the sites, but not like, not like in a full-time capacity. And actually also in terms of building up career capital, I, um, I worked for a while at PricewaterhouseCoopers, you know, the, uh, you know, consulting company, you know, kind of like very known for their structured approach. And, you know, it's a very corporate kind of environment, but I thought, okay, even if I'm going to stay in the nonprofit world for the rest of my life, I think it's definitely going to be good to at least experience what it's like, you know, to work as a business consultant. I did my master uh, thesis with them on strategic um, strategy development for nonprofit organizations. So I definitely do think there is merit in in building up career capital, especially at that time, I didn't really know exactly what to do. But, um, you know, I also thought, okay, maybe should I get a PhD? And that's where I decided, no, I don't think like, you know, spending another three or four years of my life uh, it makes a lot of sense. You know, I saw myself more, you know, as the more entrepreneurial kind of type. And, you know, if you look at, I don't know, whether it's Steve Jobs or Bill Gates, or I don't know, they, they usually don't even finish their, <laughs> their studies. So I thought, okay, maybe I can finish my master's and then get going. So that was the compromise I made. And yeah, as I said, I mean, looking back, it's hard to say, you know, what would have done better, but I definitely... I definitely thought it was a really good idea before my master's to get some practical experience because you just you just learn way more in you know in in all the theory when you have more practical applications. I mean, especially if you do you know like I did you know some management uh, management masters. 
No, awesome. And this takes us like very naturally onto what will probably be like the big chunk of our conversation, which is you founding ProVeg. Uh, can you talk a bit about what your thinking was uh, first at that moment, like when you uh, founded it? And then later on, I guess like now today, uh, what ProVeg's mission is and what kind of things you do? Well, with ProVeg, the, the, the background that a lot of people don't actually know that when I finished my studies, I, I was volunteering at what was at that time called the German Vegetarian Association. So it was a really, you know, quite old fashioned, classical, you know, vegetarian society, vegan society kind of uh, organization. But, you know, in, in my studies of, you know, nonprofit management, we had to consult uh, different different charities, and I chose that charity because you know it was focused on uh, you know on animals uh, on on farmed animals, and they actually liked what I did. I mean, it was a really tiny organization, but uh, I was you know volunteering for them for a while, and then I joined their board. I became vice president, and then actually I became kind of you know paid CEO, which sounds quite fancy being you know CEO uh, at, in in your late twenties. Uh, However, at that time, you know, we had a total staff of, I think, 2.5 full-time equivalents. So it was not a really big team. Um, but this was like the, the, the starting point. In, and that organization actually had been around for over 100 years. So that was like, you know, very, very old-fashioned. But I really saw a lot of potential because I very deeply believe, you know, that in this, that if we frame switching to a more plant-based diet as this multi-problem solution that, you know, this is this is definitely going to gain traction in the future. And that was already pretty clear, at least it was clear to me, like, you know, 15 years ago. Um, so I stuck with that organization, you know, and it has grown and grown uh, ever since. And then I also met Tobias, you know, who's also, you know, who's one of the co-founders of ProVet. And he had a, he was CEO of a similar organization in Belgium, which was called the Ethical Vegetarian Alternative. And then I also met my wife, you know, Dr. Melanie Joy, who wrote the book, wrote a book on carnism. And it was actually Tobias at that time who said, you know, if you look at other movements, you know, whether it's the environmental movement or the uh, human rights movement, there's usually always one leading global organization that, you know, kind of like, you know, stands for that movement. You know, if you think about the environmental movement, people think of Greenpeace or maybe WWF. If you think of human rights, you know, people think of, um, you know, you, uh, Amnesty International or Human Rights Watch. But when it came to the, you know, vegan movement, there was, you know, there were tons of national or local groups, but not an international brand that was actually, you know, doing that kind of work. So we basically decided that we should fill that gap. And we we had the the quite the the, the amazing um, situation that on the one hand we already had the basis of, you know, what was at that time called, you know, the German Vegetarian Association, which already had, you know, at that time I had grown it to I think 40, 40 staffers or something like that, you know, several millions of, of revenues. Um, so we had already the infrastructure of an existing organization, but at the same time, so we were able to think, okay, if we were to start new, how would we, how would we frame our organization? How would we, uh, you know, what would be our mission? What would be our vision? What would be, you know, what, like even simple things like the name. I mean, a lot of organizations, you know, they have their name from, you know, decades ago, you know, I don't know, like, you know, really, sometimes really awkward names and you know for example you know whether it's vegan society or vegetarian association or you know whatever it is and and so we were really able to to look at each of those components and basically on all the learnings that you know melanie had that tobias had that i had to really conceptualize what we perceive as you know the perfect organization to do this kind of work yeah. Well, then let's explore this this organization then. So you mentioned towards the start as well that what ProVeg is doing is focusing on the food industry as opposed to just directly on animal advocacy. Can you elaborate a bit more about what your key goals are and what your theory of change towards achieving those goals is as well? So one one important component, even though, you know, whether it's Tobias, Melanie or me, we are, you know, originally we are most motivated by, you know, animal rights or animal advocacy. Uh, yet, if you whether it's that you look at what motivates people to change their diet, or what's really important for politicians and uh, and and uh, governments and companies, or also when you look at uh, you know national budgets for different causes, you know, um, like we we once did the the analysis that I think you know in Germany people donate about two hundred or less than two hundred million to animal causes. But, you know, overall spending for the environmental sectors, that's, you know, easily like, you know, 
20 billion or when you look at like world, you know, climate change or public health, you know, these really go into billions and billions. So these budgets are much, much bigger. So for us, it was always clear. There are already a lot of like, you know, amazing um, animal charities out there. Uh, so we thought, okay, it probably makes sense to position ourselves like differently. And this is, you know, how we came up with this, what we call like the multi-problem solver, uh, you know, how we, how we frame ProVish. So we, we actually, you know, we don't uh, frame ourselves as an animal charity, but as this food awareness organization. And we, what we call like the five pros, the five pros of ProVish. And that's pro, pro taste, pro health, pro justice, pro animals, and pro um, uh, environment. And these actually go quite, I don't know if you're familiar with the uh, moral circles from Peter Singer, you know, where he says, you know, you start off quite small. And this is actually also how we, how, how one can actually see the five pros. So the, the, the taste is actually, that's your current self. So this is what everybody cares about. You know, if you know, you always care about how you feel in the present moment. Then health is often like that's your future self. You know, how am I going to future, you know, feel in the future? So that's then the next, you know, circle, so to speak. Then justice, this is when other humans come in. And that's, you know, that's when we talk about, you know, how uh, you know, a more plant-based diet helps feed, feed people, you know, in, in countries where uh, you know they don't have enough to eat. Then uh, you cross the species barrier. And that's when the animals come in, and that's you know obviously you know very important. All the farmed animals that are being eaten um, by our, you know due to our high reliance on animal products. And then last but not least, it's pro environment, which is either you know like more the whole ecosystem, but you can also see it like future generations. So um, and this is actually also encapsulated in our in our vision, which is a world where everybody chooses delicious and healthy food that is good for all humans, animals, and our planet. So you have we have those five pros also encapsulated in there to really make clear that we have this very holistic approach that's amazing i've never actually heard it linked towards this like moral circle idea but that makes complete sense as well in uh in reaching right like lots of different types of people as well who wouldn't be convinced otherwise exactly yeah yeah exactly like with that mission i mean it's actually you know like I've told this, you know, this vision, you know, we are, you know, working towards a world where everybody chooses delicious and healthy food that is good for all humans, animals, and our planet. I mean, everybody's actually okay with it because everybody's, oh yeah, delicious food, healthy food. Yeah. Why not? And oh, if it's good for all humans, animals, and the planet, well, yeah, I mean, what else is there? And so that's, you know, like com if you compare this sentence with, oh, we are fighting for a vegan world, uh, you know, it's, uh, you, you get way more buy-in. Um, so you've laid out the, the mission and the values and they sound crystal clear. The next question to ask is, how are you going about achieving these things? And maybe can you fill us in on some of the current projects that ProVeg is working towards? Yes, I'm happy to do so. So ProVeg has a you know a broad area uh, or broad areas of actions, which on the one hand is you know very much our strength, but one of the weaknesses it makes it a bit complicated to you know to describe it like just in a few sentences. So basically, we have boiled it down to you know five pillars. Uh, areas of action. So one is advancing plant and cultivated food innovation. The second is institutional and corporate engagement. Third is policy and advocacy. The third is movement building. And last but not least, we have public education and media. So all of our activities can be grouped in one of those five activities. And, uh, you know, just to give you one example, you know, when it comes to advancing Plant, uh, plant-based and uh, cultured food innovation. For example, we launched the world's first food incubator, the Probit Incubator, where we help new startups, you know, disrupting the food industry. Uh, I'd like to talk about corporate engagement in particular as well. I remember hearing about some uh, incident involving the names of the things you can call veggie burgers. Um, could you describe what that was about? Yes, well... That was actually a, quite an example where it was really helpful for us to be, you know, have these multiple areas of action. Um, so basically, there was this, um, uh, you know, from the European Union, they proposed that they would ban uh, the word like words like burger or sausages uh, to be used for plant based products. Um, and, you know, that was already, you know, a number of years ago that some politician brought this up and it was very clear that it was obviously motivated, you know, not by consumer protection, but, you know, just by, you know, protecting certain interest group. I mean, namely like the, the meat industry. So what we did a number of years ago, we actually started, you know, uh, 
creating alliances with, you know, whether it's big food companies, for example, I think, you know, Nestle, I think was part of it, but also some, some meat companies were, which were already quite advanced, who actually came out with a statement of, you know, that they don't, they don't see any need to restrict uh, the use of, you know, words like burger and sausages. Um, then we also did a lot of, you know, lobbying, meeting a lot with, you know, policymakers. And then we also on the public side, you know, we did tons of media interviews, media outreach, and we actually launched a petition, which I think to date has get, gained uh, over over 270,000 signatures. And last week, we actually, uh, you know, there was the the voting in the European Parliament and that that regulation has been rejected by the European Parliament. So that was obviously a big victory that we had. And now, you know, now these, uh, you know, words like burger and sausages can be used also for plant-based products within the European Union. So that is like a very public uh, facing kind of action as well. Uh, and, you know, get, gets a lot of media attention. Uh, but one thing that I'm curious to, to talk more about and to find out more about, which we really haven't explored yet in our series so far, is what it's actually like having these conversations with companies or with governments and with lobby makers, um, especially when it comes to negotiating certain things. So, for example, um, you often work with companies as well, right, in uh, launching new plant-based products or um, changing their own practices. And it always seems to be some sort of negotiation, right, where uh, these companies definitely want to do some things, whether that is directly for helping the animals or for better serving the consumers. Um, but on the other hand, you know, uh, when it comes to companies like like Nestle or who have you, and there are also some things that they are not yet ready to budge on. How, how does that kind of work, uh, that, that negotiation? And what, what have you really learned from that? Yeah, to be honest, I think for us, you know, like Provich has a more like of a good cop approach. So I, I, I don't know if I would use the word negotiation so much for what we do. It's more maybe more seduction, uh, or you know, we, uh, or you know, we we just try to show them, you know, what what others are doing. We show them what the market potential is. We basically, um, well, actually, maybe maybe one interesting anecdote. I was uh, I was once invited to uh, to give a talk at the German Meat Congress. And and that's really like as an event as bad as it goes, uh, you know. Basically, like the you know the four hundred most valuable or most influential representatives of the German meat industry. And first, I think I was just invited to give like a little side speech. But then, actually, uh, two days before my talk, I actually found out that they that they had scheduled me as the keynote speaker uh, because they informed me that I have like a full forty five minutes uh, to uh, for my for my keynote address. And you know, obviously, I did a lot of thinking. You know what, you know what to tell them. But basically, I I used two arguments. I said, look, radical change in our society happens usually for two reasons. Either there is like a moral conviction, you know, like let's say you know, women's rights or the abolishment of slavery. Uh, you know, like that you have you know a big moral outrage of you know a large part of society who are like ethically opposed to you know treatment of certain certain uh, you know groups in our society. And secondly, if something is like extremely inefficient, see, I was giving the the example of Blockbuster. I don't know for those who don't know the younger audience. You know, Blockbuster used to be like this huge uh, video rental store. And there was actually a, a, quite an interesting graph, you know, like how I think they had like four billions of revenue and then Netflix started and Netflix was like really tiny and nobody cared about Netflix. Um, but then it just took like, I think five years later, suddenly Blockbuster went out of business and Netflix like had f at that time, six billion revenues. So, uh, and then I said, and, and you guys from the meat industry, you, you guys, you have basically the worst of both worlds. Because what you do is like highly unethical, you know, once people really know what you guys are doing. I mean, you know, if you, if, you know, see the footage of slaughterhouses or, you know, factory farms, and it's extremely inefficient what you guys are doing. So, um, and, you know, I was obviously giving this speech and at the end, you know, that just, you know, was, was this one, one person getting up and says, yeah, Mr. Joy, I guess you can imagine that, you know, uh, nobody is happy to see your face uh, at this event here. Uh, yet you do have a very important message that we as an industry need to take very seriously. And um, actually by now, if you followed, but actually pretty much all German meat companies have started introducing plant-based options because they realize that the trajectory is really going. And with one of the meat companies we've been working, like they have even been quoted that in the media that, you know, meat is the cigarette of the future. And, uh, or they said, you know, like, okay, we do, um, we make sausages, but nobody ever says that we have to put dead animals into, you know, 
into those sausages. If we if we have other ingredients to make delicious sausages, we might as well do that. Actually, I'm curious on that point. Do you see established meat companies and the industry as a whole just being disrupted and eventually dis- displaced by like new challenges making plant-based alternatives? Or do you see some um, companies that are have started off producing meat making a switch somehow? And if so, what does that switch look like? How do I move from making meat to making a plant-based alternative? I think there's definitely going to be a switch. I think there's, you know, I think it's going to be big. Uh, you know, I always bring up the, you know, the example with uh, electric cars. You know, obviously you have Tesla, which, you know, makes, you know, amazing electric cars. But Tesla might never be the company who produces most of the electric cars. You know, they might just be good enough so that the BMWs and Mercedes and Volkswagens of the world, you know, suddenly realize, oh my God, we got to jump on the bandwagon and then also start producing. And then they can use, I think, you know, Volkswagen, I think they make like 10 million cars uh, a year. So if they really started shifting, that's when you have like really massive change. And I think it's similar like in, in the food industry, because I think what a lot of people don't realize. I mean, sometimes people think, oh my God, the meat industry and they treat it, it's like this one one entity or whatever. But if you if you actually segment it into, you know, in the value chain, I mean, for example, like supermarkets, I mean, you know, like who actually who eventually sell or, you know, or restaurants, they really don't care what they sell. I mean, I had, you know, endless conversations. We said, well, you know, we don't care how big our meat section is, you know, whether we sell veggie meat or regular meat. I mean, we probably even have a higher profit margin on the veggie meat. So, you know, we even prefer that. And then you have, you know, the, you know, the, the gross retailers and they don't really care what they, you know, what they sell. And then you even have the producers, you know, like some of the meat companies that we have, uh, you know, we have worked with, you know, who, as I said earlier, you know, who are, who are quite agnostic with, you know, what kind of sausages they make, you know, what kind of ingredients they use. And then on the, on the other end of the spectrum, you have the farmers uh, who produce ingredients and they don't necessarily, you know, whether they say, well, whether we create soy for human consumption or whether we have soy for animal consumption. I mean, we might actually even make more money if we create soy for human consumption. So you actually only have a rather limited amount. I mean, obviously slaughterhouses, you know, you don't really need slaughterhouses and, you know, you don't really need direct, you know, factory farms or maybe animal transport. But that's actually like in the whole scheme of things that is not that huge of an industry. And all the others can relatively easily pivot so and that and that's I think what people really have to realize, you know, that there might be and even those I would not say that those are like you know the enemies because even those you know you can make a case okay why don't you slowly transition to other forms and blah blah blah. So I think yes, I definitely think that you know we should transform the food system, which does not mean that you know that we don't want to have disruptive uh, you know ideas coming from startups and this is why Probert you know besides working a lot with really big companies you know Unilever. Nestle and you know the all the all the big conglomerates that there are, but that how we also work you know with with the help of our incubator, which was actually the world's first plant incubator focused on uh, you know supporting disruptive uh, plant based companies. Uh, how we also use those to help them because those are the ones who often bring out more innovation and who then in turn you know motivate the big players in society. One thing I wanted to talk about as well, uh, just on this kind of corporate engagement, is one criticism that you often hear about this good cop approach is the question to how much change uh, you're actually bringing forth as well. Because clearly uh, companies like like uh, Knorr or um, who have you, uh, you know, they, they they get a huge benefit out of having this, this pro-veg stamp of approval as well when it comes to, to selling things to customers or in how they present themselves. How can you make sure when you're working with these companies as well that you are creating meaningful change and you kind of are uh, pushing things as effectively as you can as opposed to these critiques of greenwashing that that you hear? Well, I think what's important to notice and, you know, Provid not engage in any welfare campaigns. So, you know, I know that, you know, obviously within the EA movement, when it comes to animal advocacy, one of the, you know, activities that people, uh, you know, engage a lot is in raising the welfare standards, you know, getting rid, for example, of, of caged eggs. And then obviously, I think, you know, then obviously the, you know, the, the question often comes, you know, will this eventually prevent future advancement or will it actually, you know, be beneficial for ad- advancements? And there are obviously, you know, I think it's relatively easy for companies to use this like as an argument. Well, you know, we only have free range X now. So, 
you know, why well, should should we go further? Uh, what Provage does is more, you know, we help companies shift from animal based products to plant based products. And uh, obviously, you know, and it doesn't really make sense for the company to say, oh, now we have five veggie burgers. Why should we make more? Because, you know, if there's a consumer demand and people really like it and their products are getting better and better, uh, you know, every time. And then, you know, the more the more amazing plant-based products they, they you know, they market and put out there, the more people are actually um, are getting excited about. And we obviously also, you know, for example, like, you know, some of the meat companies we work, we have a more detailed look into their in their budget spendings. And it's not like that they use the small profits that they're making with the plant-based products to then, you know, secretly market their meat products. Quite the opposite is true. You know, they use, they still have, a, you know, they have a lot of profit coming from the old established markets and then they use it to invest in the new ones. I mean, again, think about, you know, you know, Mercedes, it, it wouldn't make sense for Mercedes to say, oh yeah, we make a bit of profit selling electric cars and then we subsidize our old diesels. No, it's, it's rather the other way around. You know, they say, okay, we are making million, we are still selling millions of millions of combustion engine, but the profits we're using, uh, we are making, we are using to actually develop better electric cars. And that's similar to what we see in the, in the, in the food sector. Okay, let's jump forwards then and just talk about some other uh, ventures of yours, aside from ProVeg. I mean, you talk about yourself an entrepreneur and you've started a bunch of things. And um, I take it not all of these have been as successful as ProVeg. If you're down, can you just tell us about some of your ventures that ended up failing and what did you learn from those failures? Uh, yeah, uh, quite a bunch. I mean, it was, you know, a number of campaigns. It was, I mean, at one point we uh, wanted to create like, or created like a, a charity that was going into schools and was educating um, children about the benefits of, a, you know, either of a plant-based diet, but also about, you know, how they should care about animals. And at some point we actually even got the, the support from the Berlin Senate who was sending out, it was kind of interesting because we literally convinced the, basically like the, the government in Berlin to send out letters to 800 schools to invite the, you know, the volunteering teachers that we've had at that time. Um, but, you know, eventually, you know, that, that did not work out. And I think one of the learnings was, um, I mean, it was it was hard to scale up, and it was you know ex this, there was not really like a business model behind it, and it was difficult to uh, find enough volunteers at a high high quality who would actually do those kind of activities. So yes, so obviously I am a bit sad that that didn't really work out, but I'm you know I'm also you know it's okay. Um, another thing is you know obviously we launched uh, I helped you know conceptualize and then launch Veggie World which uh, became the world's largest vegan fair. I think at some point we had mm, close to 20 events in, I think, nine or 10 different countries all around the world. But then obviously with Corona hitting, uh, a lot of the venues had to close. And, you know, we're still, I mean, it's still going to continue, but, you know, probably focusing more on, on the German venues and not, you know, it's, it's, it's hard, you know, to make that international expansion happening. Um, yeah, so those, those would be two examples that... Whenever you're proposing some startup, you're going to be met with um, skepticism and pushback. And sometimes that is going to be like naysayers who turn out to be wrong. And sometimes it's going to be like really worth listening to and, and like on the money. Do you have some feel now for telling apart those different kinds of skepticism? <laughs> Yes, that's that's definitely a good question. Uh, what is this quote from Steve Jobs? I think, you know, the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. Um, but obviously, there are also a lot of crazy people in the world that are not changing the world or that are not changing it for the better. And obviously, you also get a lot of, you know, survival bias. You know, what is it with Henry Ford? If, if Henry Ford would have listened to the consultants, he would have, you know, worked on faster horses and not on automobiles. Um, yes, I mean, you do get a, I think... I think it takes a bit of, obviously, you know, you need some market experience to like get a, you know, well, I would actually even say like, you know, kind of like an intuition and, you know, I'm a bit of a, I'm like a fan of what's called like the, you know, the lean startup or lean startup method. Um, but, you know, often I don't really exactly know how it's going to end up, what we want to do, but maybe there's only like a, maybe there's like only like a market or there's only like a, like an idea, for example, like a, a number of years ago, we 
uh, we realized that you know social media influencers are like really becoming more and more more well influential in society. You know, like you have all these people. You know, it's not necessarily like big media or big companies, but you know, some suddenly you have like you know twelve year olds who have like you know two million followers on on Facebook or, or Instagram or whatever. Uh, so now we're actually working together with an with an agency to. Um, uh, to work on what's called the Provage Impactor Awards. And it's basically an award system to work with those kinds of influencers and to motivate them to, uh, you know, talk more about plant-based eating and animal welfare and, you know, the environmental impact of animal agriculture. And I mean, obviously we don't really know yet exactly how it's going to work out, but I have like, I have a good gut feeling that this is going to be quite a successful campaign. Or for example, when we launched uh, the Provage Incubator, I mean, you know, we had that idea many, many years before and I actually knew some friends who, you know, started some, or we actually even started something at some point and then, you know, it was, was too early and we had to close it down again. Um, but then, you know, three years ago, we really thought, oh my God, there's more and more startups happening. You know, if we were to, if we were the first, uh, the first ones to actually launch an incubator that is focused on, you know, disruptive food technology, wouldn't that be amazing? And you know, within, I think it was actually within less than six months we have, you know, brought that that idea, you know, from well, from the ideation phase to actually launching the incubator, and that has been a huge success. I mean, to date we've had over forty startups that we've helped. They have raised over twenty million dollars. Uh, 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 the last cohort uh, that we just selected now, uh, we had uh, we had over one hundred and forty applications. So we are getting tons of media attention from you know whether it's Russia, Chile, uh, China. Uh, so so. This was really, you know, you got to be at the at the right place at the right time. You've mentioned this this incubator. You uh, are also a mentor for charity entrepreneurship, so you must see an incredible amount of people um, who who are involved, right, in the startup scene. And uh, there, are there any like tips for maybe listeners who are thinking about getting involved uh, with this? Like, what is a good fit? What kind of qualities or, or what kind of uh, advice can you give to, to to those people as well on things they might be able to work on now before they uh, try to set up their own? Uh, well, I startup? I can totally recommend. Uh, you know, life as an entrepreneur. So, I mean, obviously, you know, personality has to fit, you know, you have to live, be able to live with uncertainties. It's probably helpful if you don't, you know, do it early in your life when you don't have too many obligations and are not being, you know, bogged down by, oh, I have three kids to feed and a mortgage to pay. That might not be the best uh, condition, you know, to especially, you know, like to, to, to start a startup. Um, I think getting the right combination between gaining experience in more established settings. But even then, I would actually still say, you know, maybe join a startup and see what it's like. I think it's a bit over overvalued that, you know, you have to be, uh, you know, that you have to, you know, have worked in, you know, lot, lots of companies, you know, whether it's, you know, Steve Jobs or Bill Gates or whatever, you know, people, some people really started early and there are actually studies about the most or the single reasons why startups succeed. And that is actually being at the right place at the right time. You know, gaining experience and often, you know, people, they might not have a, uh, they might not have exactly the, the right idea yet. And oh, yeah, maybe a, a fun idea. What, one thing that we did at some point is, um, you know, I was having a, a number of vegan friends who, who were taking supplements to, uh, for their vitamin B12, you know, which is one ingredient that's hard to come by. And, and I thought, well, I don't really feel comfortable like taking pills. You know, I mean, I, you know, I think plant-based diet is healthy, but they say, well, but, you know, got to really got to make sure that you d get enough B12. And, um, and then they also said, well, you know, it's, it's actually best to like leave the, if you take a B12 pill to actually leave it on your tongue and, you know, because it's actually absorbed by the gums, uh, you know, it's not only, you know, not, not only by the stomach. And then, you know, one day I was brushing my teeth, my teeth as I do, you know, and I thought, Hey, wait a minute. I just have my whole mouth full of toothpaste. What if there was B12 in the toothpaste? Like, wouldn't my gums be able to absorb it? And then I told a few friends about it who thought I was totally crazy. And, uh, but then I looked into it and I, I, you know, reached out to some researchers and I actually found some unpublished studies where they actually did some kind of testing where they'd say, yeah, I mean, there is awesome indications. And then we, we put together like a little dossier where we, we laid out, you know, the market opportunities and then we've sent it out to a numbers of toothpaste companies, uh, you know, and most of them didn't even bother to respond because they thought you were just like lunatics, but they were like, you know, I think two or three companies who thought, oh yeah, miss, you know, maybe we should have a conversation. Um, 
And then we actually selected one of them and, and they were actually open to give it a try. Uh, and which was really funny. But then obviously we also had to do a peer reviewed study, but we didn't have any money to do the study. So we had like a, we did like a social media, uh, social media burst where we said, okay, look, this could be life changing for the, for the vegan community. So we actually had, instead of people getting paid to participate in the study, we actually had people paying to be allowed to participate in our study, which was quite an interesting business model at that time. Um, but so, so we finally did get our, our first study uh, out the door and it actually, uh, you know, uh, lo and behold, uh, the study, you know, the toothpaste did prove to be effective. And now there are actually a number of uh, studies have come out by reputable journals. And, you know, obviously now that that toothpaste is marketed on a, you know, international level, I think, you know, selling several hundred thousands or whatever, how many uh, a year. Uh, so that was obviously, you know, quite a, an interesting story where, you know, in the beginning, a lot of people thought that's crazy, but where it was, you know, important to be consistent or, or persistent, so to speak. Let, let's assume uh, in this hypothetical scenario, uh, I've come with my version of a uh, vitamin B12 toothpaste and it's going great. And uh, we, we've sent out the first few batches, but an equally like daunting challenge is scaling this, right? And uh, you mentioned right at the start, you've uh, seen these these amazing uh, scales ups of organizations from the, the German Vegan Society from two and a half to, to 40 uh, employees. And uh, likewise with ProVeg and all these other things you've you've been involved with. Um, how do you view this scaling up process? Um, how do your tasks as a founder change? And what kind of advice could you give uh, to people uh, facing those challenges at the moment? Yeah, very good question. I think what certainly helps, and that's also why I love to, you know, like love to call myself like a serial social entrepreneur. Um, and I, I have on my website, I have this quote uh, that the amount of good that you can achieve is, is without limits if you don't care who gets the credit. And I think that's like really important. So for example, like with the toothpaste, you know, we could have gone, you know, trying to patent it or, you know, making a lot of complicated ways, but basically we just, we just threw out the ideas to, you know, to all the companies and a lot of the toothpaste companies, you know, they could have just said, okay, we're going to take the idea and run with it. You know, we couldn't have any like legal right to, to, to hold them accountable. And, um, I mean, not caring who gets the credit, I think, can can literally like really make make a big difference because sometimes, you know, you just need to have an idea. We need great people to implement it. And we may, you know, maybe need some trusted people who help us finance it in the beginning. And those three are like the main ingredients that you need. You mentioned that uh, one of the biggest, if not the biggest factors in deciding the success of an early stage startup is just timing, whether in the right place at the right time. In the context of a non-profit startup, how do I know that my great idea is in the right place at the right time? Are there like tools or methods that I can use to find that out before I waste my time and money uh, finding out the hard way? I think, you know, talking with a lot of people who know this fear, I think that's definitely helpful. So, you know, I think sometimes people are a bit too afraid to, you know, sharing the idea because they think, oh my God, somebody might steal it and somebody else might do it. And I mean, and and I had that feeling myself, but you know, again, I mean, I think and that's that's actually the good thing about being in the nonprofit world because you can usually say, well, it's not about make, being rich anyway. So, <laughs> so, you know, if somebody else wants to do it even better then I can, you know, find even another idea. So to some extent, you know, sharing the, sharing the idea widely is, you know, even better. Uh, yes, I think certainly talking, uh, you know, finding out more. Yeah, so for example, like one startup uh, in the in the last year's cohort of the charity entrepreneurship is the the Fish Welfare Initiative, and I think in this case it was very clear that you know that you know the animal advocacy has been around for you know like I mean many of the big organizations for you know. 10, 20, 30 years. And, but there was more and more awareness around fish because, you know, obviously, I mean, I, I don't have to tell you guys, but, you know, like, you know, the numbers of victims or, you know, fish that are being killed or, you know, or suffering agriculture is just astronomical. And, you know, there are tons of initiatives and most of the established groups, I mean, they were trying to do a bit of fish, but not so much. So whether it was, you know, that the EA community was interested or that we knew, okay, they're really EA motivated funders are really excited about this. And obviously that's that's always a big, I mean, as a charity, making the funding work is the most, the biggest challenge. So when you know that, you know, some, some big funders are really excited about something, that's always a, 
a good sign. And I mean, and that that's what I love so much about the EA movement, because it's very much obviously in alignment what EA funders think is important and what's really important for the world. Because, you know, sometimes when you, for example, when you write, rely on on government funding, they're never going to be at the forefront of innovation. You know, now suddenly, like, you know, the you know, government start to realize plant-based diet is also good, you know, good, good for climate change or something like that. I mean, actually, actually Provich, like two years ago, uh, Provich was awarded uh, the Momentum for Change Awards from the United Nations. And on the one hand, I thought, well, we've been saying that for 20 years now. I mean, finally, the United Nations actually is also making the connection. So obviously there was, you know, there was, it was positive in, in that regard that, you know, like, you know, finally getting big players to recognize. But I also thought to myself, well, maybe it's actually time to do something else because if even the government's already realizing that that's a problem we should address, then maybe, you know, it's, you know, we should, you know, be more at the forefront. And that's, you know, for example, like the Fish Welfare Initiative comes in, you know, because, you know, no government in the world would spend, you know, billions, millions of dollars to improve the welfare of fish at this stage. So this is why, you know, it's important to work with, you know, really forward thinking philanthropists who really like, you know, have have a visionary mindset and who are very EA minded and who are really like, who are not, you know, wanting to take the, the well-trodden paths, but who really, you know, want to go new ways. That's so interesting. It, it links to something um, I heard once before, which is that anybody working at an NGO, like the ultimate goal is to, to put yourself out of a job, right? Because you're trying to solve the problem, or at least, as you mentioned, get it so wide that there's enough recognition that these uh, bigger players can start moving in. And then that gives you an opportunity to, to move on to the next thing. Yeah, I mean, this is, yeah, I mean, this is what, what Provich has been doing, you know, ever, or, you know, even the organization before, I mean, ever we have been, you know, we, we often get started and then when something gets big, that's when, you know, the big companies come in and then, you know, like, even like with the veggie world that I've said, you know, like that, that trade show that we've conceptualized, I mean, in the beginning, there was no way to make money with it, but then we convinced like an agency and then they, you know, they started making also some revenues and that, that's when they, you know, then they got more investors excited about it and then that's when it started to grow exponentially. One one last thing I wanted to ask about just on this entrepreneurship topic is uh, you mentioned one of the key ingredients of success as well is the people you work with and surrounding yourself with. And um, could you elaborate a bit more about that? I, I, as I said, I would definitely recommend you know starting one's own project, but I think it's really good to do so. You know learning the ropes with more experienced people and maybe even like joining an environment that allows you to, you know, to experiment. I mean, at, at Probit, you know, I always like, you know, we encourage people to come up with new ideas and to what I, you know, what's called like in, intrapreneurs, you know, like people who are working within the safety of an organizations, but who, you know, can conceptualize ideas or new departments or new programs that are then maybe even being spun off and creating like their own entity. And like one example, like would be, you know, would be 50 by 40, uh, which started off as our, as Provich's mission. And so the idea was, you know, we, to reduce the consumption of animal products by 50% by the year 2040. And we have actually created that mission with the help of a consultant who, who analyzed the number of over 100 movements all around the world. I mean, he traveled with Barack Obama uh, in 2008 when he won. He was the strategic campaign advisor of Angela Merkel when she had like her big victory. And, you know, he in, looked into tests Law and Apple and the hippie movement. And he looked like, you know, what makes movement successful? So we actually basically invited him, you know, to a number of workshops, asking him, okay, look, we want to, you know, create this plant-based world, but how we do it. And, you know, then he came up with that formula of, you know, uh, reducing animal consumption by 50% by 2040, which then became Provich's mission. But then we met, you know, you know, forward thinking philanthropists who actually said, well, this should not only be, you know, Provich's mission, this could be way, way more. So what we actually is creating now is we created like, you know, a little, you know, kind of like a spin-off, which is called 50by40.org, which is a so-called collective impact organization or like, you know, an alliance of many, many charities. I think at the moment we have um, over 50 partners from all over the world, you know, including really big players like Greenpeace, Friends of the Earth, NRDC, um, and all of them, you know, are subscribing to the mission of reducing animal consumption by 50% by the year 2040. And at the same time, now that we have all these, you know, this growing number of charities and NGOs working on that, now we are also approaching like really big funders, you know, like the, you know, Rockefeller Foundation, Wellcome Trust, you know, Bill Gates Foundation and blah, 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 you know, to, to actually really take notice and, you know, obviously combine the charities that are doing the work and the big philanthropists and foundations who want to support work like this. 
Okay, so some final questions which we ask everyone. The first one is, uh, what significant thing have you recently changed your mind about and why? Well, it wasn't super recently, but I had quite an aha moment learning about wild animal suffering uh, at the Sentience Conference. It, that's already a number of years ago, but I was quite intrigued because, you know, I've considered myself like an animal advocate for, uh, I think, over a decade at that time, but I never really gave it that much thought about, you know, you know the implications of wild animal suffering and what that means for uh, EA. Nice, good answer. Um, Peter, we asked Peter Singer about that, and um, it sounds like he's interested in it as well, but it's kind of, it's a new idea for everyone, I suppose. Okay, second question. What three books or articles, films, whatever, would you recommend for anyone interested in finding out more about everything we've talked about? Or alternatively, those books that had an impact on your own thinking? I can definitely recommend uh, How to Create a Vegan World by Tobias Leonard. I mean, for people who are you know more direct into the, into the plant-based sphere. Um, I can also, in terms of startup and, um, you know, how to go about it, uh, there's a book called Lean Startup from Eric Ries, which I think is, yeah, I, I think it's, 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 a, it's a great way to start and, you know, to get the right mindset about, you know, living with uncertainties and making, you know, developing the plan going as long as we go. And, um, well, I think, I mean, Simon Sinek, I really like him a lot. You know, he gave that quite famous TED Talk, how leaders how, how i think how great leaders inspire action uh, but he also wrote a book about leaders eat last uh, which i enjoyed a lot so i would definitely check him out great and very last question first of all where can people find out more about proveg and about you online and also are there any opportunities going right now that someone might be interested in applying to so obviously if you want to learn more about uh, myself that would be sebastianjoy.com uh Proveg, learning more about Proveg would be Proveg.com. And then we also have 50by40.org. And with regards to becoming active, uh, I mean, obviously, you know, Proveg, we're always looking for, you know, motivated uh, people who want to wanna join the cause and who want to, you know, help us on our mission, whether that's, you know, as volunteers or whether that's as paid staff. We are actually also have something very unique in Germany, but it's obviously open for everybody uh, around the world. Uh, it's called like a, a federal volunteer service. So basically you can do like a volunteering between six and 18 months and you're getting a, you get a stipend from the government, which is actually quite interesting and you're being health insured. So um, yeah, I, I would have loved that when I was young. I, I didn't have the opportunity, but that's, I think uh, also, you know, for those who want to gain some experience, but who think, well, I, I cannot volunteer all the time and maybe I don't have enough a skill set to apply at a full-time position, then I think that's a great way to start. Sebastian Joy, thank you very much. That was Sebastian Joy on ProVeg, movement building and corporate engagement. As always, if you want to learn more, you can read the write-up at hearthisidea.com forward slash episodes forward slash Sebastian. We've also included a bunch of resources if you want to get involved in animal advocacy, ranging from volunteering to full-time positions. If you haven't yet, do also listen back to some of our previous episodes with other leading figures in this movement. If you have any feedback, please do let us know. It would be particularly useful to hear if you want us to delve deeper into animal rights at some point, like more direct career advice or on the psychology of eating meat. Also, do let us know if you like this mini-series format where we explore one big topic over several episodes with different guests. The best place to do that is to email us at feedback at hearthisidea.com or to fill out the form at the top of every write-up. We'd really love to hear from you. Finally, if you enjoy these episodes and want to help other people find them too, why not leave us an honest review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening to this. And if you want to help us pay for hosting these episodes online, you can also leave a tip by following the link in the description. Thanks very much for listening. <laughs>